Good night, everyone, and welcome back to another Friday night where we discuss God's Word. And um, before we start, I just want to give God praise and thanks for what He has done within the last week. I received calls from a few people that told me, you know, some more prayer requests also, and some people who told me what God has been doing in their lives. I want to especially thank God for my cousin Ryan, who God has touched in a remarkable way. And um, I'll leave that testimony to him, but God touched him, took away his pain, and um, healed him. And he couldn't wait to tell me also, I want to thank God for the way he has moved. The last broadcast I did on Sunday, Easter Sunday, um, my, and you know, the Bible says that your testimony is as a sermon. And so we should tell our testimony. And so as I was preaching or, or presenting last week, Sunday, not last week, Sunday, but Sunday that just gone, um, Easter Sunday. I was praying and asking God that he would let those who want to hear this message hear it. And I don't know how he would do it, but I just asked him to do that. My cousin said that he, he lives in England and he said that the phone was next to him and he woke up. Obviously, they're five hours ahead. And as he woke up, um, you know, he looked at his phone to get the the time and as he unlocked the phone he heard my voice and he could see me speaking and so he he looked at it and he was like wow I, I mean I didn't get a notification how did this just come up on my phone and at the same time his partner who lives in a different house she said that she had the phone off to the side and just like that my voice started coming through the phone. The screen was locked. The phone was dark, was, you know, was the screen was black and the phone was locked. And she said, you know, she heard my voice coming through the phone. She knows what my voice sounds like because she listens to me. And she said, she tried to turn it off and she couldn't get it off. She tried to unlock it. You know, it took a while to get it unlocked. She gave it to her son to get it unlocked and I guess she was doing something else and didn't want to hear my voice, but God wanted her to hear it. <laughs> and so it didn't matter what she did, the voice was still there until she actually pulled the battery from the phone. And then, you know, she tried to go back then to hear it. Then she was ready and she couldn't see it. So she wanted to find out how did it come there in the first place. So she asked me to send a message to her with the the link to the video and, and she saw it. And so um, today though, I want to... Let's just pray to start, and I want to give God praise for that. So, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I just want to thank you for the way that you're moving in our lives, in people's lives. Thank you for all the people that you healed. Thank you for healing Ryan, dear Father, and touching him in a remarkable way so that he does not even, he cannot even deny it, dear Father. Not that he wanted to deny it. He knows that it's you, but you did it in a way that is unquestionable that he has to know it's you. And I give you praise and I give you thanks for that. Thank you for the way that you um, made sure, as I prayed, that people would listen to this. Thank you for the way that you made sure that it went to those people that you wanted it to go to. And so I give you praise and, and, and glory and honor. And I also would like to lift Speed's father before you, dear father. He's, he's in the hospital and I pray that you will touch him. As Speed asked me to pray for him, dear Father, touch him in a remarkable way. Help that whatever is going on with him, that the doctors would find it. And that even before they um, find anything wrong with him, that he would be healed. In the name of Jesus. And so he would be released from hospital. And we thank you for, for Anne Marie that was healed and for all those who you have healed, dear Father. Dr. Honoré's son and Dr. Honoré and Pastor John's son and everyone. 
So we give you all the praise, all the honor, and all the glory, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. I pray that as I speak here tonight, that you will assign those who you would like to hear this message and that you would reach them. This message will reach them in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And so today I want to speak to you about the light. Have you seen the light? What light am I talking about? Well, you have to listen to find out what light I'm talking about. So Stephen had just preached a powerful sermon. He was teaching and rebuking the people, calling them to account for, you know, the actions, the things that they had done. And his word, the scripture says, cut them like a knife, it cut their heart. And the people did not want to hear that kind of message. Sounds familiar? Like some people don't want to hear the real message of God. They want to hear something that make them feel good. But what Peter was, what um, I'm sorry, Stephen was preaching was not a feel good message. It was a message that would cut them like a knife. And so they didn't want to hear the truth. And so what they did was, the scripture says that they gnashed on him with their teeth. Acts 7, 54. And as I go on, it says, Then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. Like they all ran at him at the same time. And they cast him out of the city, and they decided to stone him. And Stephen was full of the Holy Spirit. As they did this to him, he was so full of the Holy Spirit while he was preaching that he looked up. And as he looked up, he saw the glory of God and the heavens opened up. The scripture says the heavens opened up and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Acts 7, 55. Now, as the scripture goes on, it says, and they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God. Can you imagine? So he's calling on God. And they are stoning him. And, this, and, and he was saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So Stephen is praying and asking God to receive his spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice. And he said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. So he's saying, Lord, forgive them. Do not charge them with this sin. And when he had said this, the scripture says that he fell asleep. And so Stephen was stoned for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And you might think this, 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 um, this sermon today is about Stephen, but it actually is not about Stephen. It's about the man that was standing there and watched Stephen as he was stoned. And so the scripture says that, this, that the accusers laid their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul cons consented to Stephen's death. So Saul stood there. He's not the one that was stoning Stephen. But he stood there and he did nothing. And so the scripture says that he consented to Stephen's death. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. In Acts 8, you can read about it. As for Saul, he became one of the church's persecutors. The scripture says in Acts 8, 3, As for Saul, he made havoc on the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So Saul... This young man that witnessed Stephen's death went into homes and started dragging the Christians out and persecuting them, both men and women. Then in, in Acts 9, it picks it up. It says, Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest. So he's not satisfied that he's persecuting the Christians. Now he wants to make it official. He wants the power of the state behind him so that he can do even more damage. And so he went to the high priest and he asked a letter from him to the synagogues, to take to the synagogues of Damascus. And he wanted this so that if he found anyone who were 
on his, when he was on his way there or when he got there, if he found anyone, whether man or woman, might bring the bond of Jerusalem, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And so Paul set out on a journey to seek out the followers of Christ in Damascus and persecute them. That was his plan. So here he is heading to Damascus and he wants to find these Christians, followers of Jesus, and persecute them. But as he traveled, Jesus himself showed up and stopped him in his tracks. You see, Paul believed that what he was doing was right. He believed that those who were following Jesus or believed in Jesus were blaspheming. Like the rest of the Jews, he also believed that the Messiah had not yet come. He was still waiting for the Messiah to come. Even though they all saw all the prophecies and knew the prophecies of Jesus' birth and of the Messiah's arrival, they still did not believe that that was Jesus. They knew the prophecies of his birth, his life, and his death and resurrection, and still they did not believe that that was him. And so what Saul was doing, he thought it was right. He figured that he would do the bidding of God because these people were blaspheming. They didn't expect that Jesus would be born in a manger because that was too humble. They expected him to come in glory and set up a kingdom on the earth. And so that's why they did not accept Jesus. They did not understand what Jesus was saying, the teachings of Jesus. And so, like them, Saul wanted to get rid of all these so-called blasphemers. So he figured, you know what? He's doing right and there's nothing that can stop him. He had God behind him. Do you know anyone like that? He was so convinced that his way was the right way. That Jesus had, that Jesus had to take drastic steps against him. Sometimes God has to do something drastic to get our attention. Jesus had to stop him in his tracks. He had to knock him off of his horse. Do you hear what I'm saying? You get what I'm saying? Sometimes when we do not listen to God, when he's trying to get our attention and we do not listen, God has to take drastic measures in order to get our attention. And so, he knocked him off his horse. This was the only way that Jesus could have gotten his attention. When Jesus knocked him off of his horse, he didn't only knock him off of his horse, but he, he made him blind. He made him helpless in order to really get his attention. Let me get, tell you exactly as the scripture says it. The scripture says in Acts 9 from verse 3, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground. Now that light that Paul saw, that Saul saw, is the light I'm asking you, have you seen the light? That's the light that knocked Paul off of his horse. In John, the scripture says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among men. It also says that the word is the light. And the light shone among men. And, the, and it shone in darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. That light is Jesus Christ. And here the light shone all around Paul, Saul. And he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Paul and Saul, Saul stopped. He didn't have a choice. He was on the ground now. And, 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 and he said, Who are you, Lord? Who are you, Lord? So when he said, Who are you, Lord? Right away, we can tell that he understood that it was not a man that he was seeing. It was a supernatural being. And he knew that it was God. Because he didn't say, Who are you? He said, Who are you, Lord? And so then the Lord said to him, I am Jesus. Whom you are persecuting. <laughs> so Jesus at that point told him who he was. 
And, he, and Jesus said to him, it is hard for you to kick against the goads or, or the pricks. In other words, in a new, another translation says the pricks. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And so, as the scripture goes on, it says, and so he, tremble, he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? So now this great powerful man of the army that was set out with his soldiers to go and cause persecution of the Christians, he now is so scared and he is he, he fell to the ground and he was trembling and he was astonished by what had happened. And he asked, what do you want of me? Or what do you want me to do? And then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. Verse 7 says, And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no one. And so the army that was around him, they all were astonished because they, they saw this light and they heard the voice, but they could not see Jesus. And so they were astonished. Then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were opened, meaning he opened his eyes, not that he wasn't blind because he was struck blind. So when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. The same place he was going to persecute the Christians. They led him into Damascus blind. He left to go to Damascus, a powerful man on horseback. And he was taken into Damascus, a blind, humbled man. And he was there three days without sight. The scripture in verse 9 says that he was there three days without sight. Neither did he eat or drink. So in effect, you see that he was actually fasting. Mm -hmm. Jesus had to show him it was serious. He had to give him back the sight. He couldn't give him back his sight right away because if he had given him back his sight right away, what would happen? Maybe he would have said, maybe I imagined it, mm -hmm. right? Maybe it would look like, it didn't really happen. Maybe he would have said, I imagined it. Something could have happened. Maybe I was drunk. Maybe I was drinking. Different things happened and I don't believe it really happened. So God made sure that he stayed blind for three days. And during that time, he realized his mistake. And he went into fasting and prayer. And so... He was contemplating his sin and what God would do to him. Because remember, Jesus did not tell him what he was going to do. He said, you know, what do you want of me? And Jesus said, go into the city and it will be told you. So for three days, Jesus left him blind for him to understand what it is that he'd done to, to contemplate what it is that he had done. That was wrong. How he persecuted his people. Now. What's amazing about this story. Is that. Jesus. Went to. He gave a vision to a man called Ananias. And the scripture says it like this. There was a certain disciple. At Damascus named Ananias. And to him the Lord. Said in a vision. Ananias. And he said here I am Lord. So the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. And behold, he is praying. Mm -hmm. So God knew that Jesus knew that Saul was fasting and praying. Mm -hmm. He said, Behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming and putting his hands on him so that he might receive sight. So Jesus did not only give the vision to Ananias. He gave the vision to Saul so that Saul would know, so that Ananias would know who he was going to and so that Saul would know that Ananias was coming. You see, when Jesus reveals something to you, he does it in a way that is undeniable. That there will be no doubt in your mind. 
It has to be something that you can't argue with. <laughs> Ananias, though, had heard about Saul, right? He knew that Saul was persecuting the Christians. And he had heard that Saul was coming to Damascus persecute. to persecute the Christians. And so he questioned Jesus' decision. But nevertheless, he obeyed. He did not understand how a man that was coming to persecute God's people could end up <laughs> being someone that Jesus would ask him to go to. And so the scripture says in 13, Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much harm he has done to the saints in Jerusalem. And there he has authority from the chief priests and bind, to bind all who call on your name. Mm -hmm. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is a chosen vessel. Exactly. Did you hear that? Jesus said, Go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Yes. To bear my name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So Jesus had a purpose for Saul. He, was he said, yes. For I will show for I will show him how many will suffer or how many things he will suffer for my name's sake. And so Ananias went and entered the house and laid hands on Saul. And he said, this is how Ananias greeted him. Ananias said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you came has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. So right away, when Ananias said this to Saul, Saul would know, he would know that this is straight from Jesus. Because remember, Jesus told him to go and wait and he would receive instructions. So how would, the, how would Ananias know what happened on the road to Damascus? So right away, he knew that it was straight from the Holy Spirit. So he said to him that you would receive sight, but not only that you would receive sight, but that you would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And what happened? Immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales. So as Ananias laid hands on Saul, there fell from his eyes something like scales. And he received his sight at once. It was not over a period of time. Immediately his sight came back. And he arose and was baptized right away. Saul did not have to go and study <laughs> for how many weeks or months in order to start God's work. Mm -hmm. Saul arose, was baptized and straight away, he was baptized right away as hands were laid on him. And as the Holy Spirit hit him, he was baptized right away. Immediately, the scripture says in verse 20, immediately he preached the Christ. The same Christ that he was persecuting the followers, immediately after his baptism, he preached the Christ in the synagogues. That he is the Son of God. You see, he didn't have to wait on permission from anyone. Exactly. He didn't have to be ordained. Exactly. He was ordained when Jesus met him on the, the road to Damascus. He was ordained when Ananias laid hands on him. And right away, he started to preach God's word. And he preached that Jesus is the Son of God. Then all who heard him were amazed. Because he didn't just preach what he wanted to preach. He preached what God wanted him to preach. He preached with the full of the Holy Spirit. And so right away, right away, he was accepted by the people. Not, not exactly right away he was accepted by the people. But right away the people started listening. Because he... Preach Jesus is the Son of God. And then right away they said that 
the people were amazed. And this is what they said. Is this not he who destroyed those who called on this name in Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. So here he is preaching Jesus Christ is the son of God. But this is the same man that destroyed those that called on Jesus' name in Jerusalem. And they said, and has come here for that purpose. So they know that he came to Damascus for the purpose of destroying the people of God. But yet, here he is preaching Jesus Christ and him crucified. And so they said, so that he might bring them bound to the chief priests. They know that he was supposed to come and persecute the Christians so that he can carry them bound to the chief priests. But he was preaching God. When Jesus chooses you as a vessel to preach his gospel, those who know your past will have a hard time believing that you are now converted. Amen. Not everyone will accept the fact that God has converted you. Exactly. Especially if it's done in, in a rapid succession or if it's done immediately. Because most people, it takes a certain amount of time for them to be converted. So when God converts you and helps you and, and cleanses you immediately, it is hard for some people to accept it. This is why when you know your purpose, your commission, you should just keep doing the work no matter who doubt you. Just do God's work. The more they doubted Saul, the more he increased in strength exactly. and confounded them. The scripture says that he confounded them because the words that were coming from his mouth, they didn't know how he could know these things. But the Holy Spirit was speaking through, through Paul, Saul. And I'll tell you why I'm calling him Saul up till now. The scripture in 22 says, But Saul increased all the more in strength and confounded the Jews who dwelt in Damascus, proving that this Jesus is the Christ. Then, Jews, then the Jews plotted to kill him. And he had to be taken out of the city. So the Jews said, no, this man came, was supposed to persecute the Christians. Mm -hmm. And now he's preaching about Christ. Yeah, no, yeah. we need to get rid of him. And so they tried to kill him. And the disciples, they, they, um, they had to take him out of the city. And Acts 9.26 says, And when Saul had come to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples. But they were all afraid of him. And did not believe that he was a disciple. You see, you can't blame the disciples right here because they did not know about Saul's conversion. All they know is that Saul persecuted them and that he was there when Stephen was, was stoned. Uh -huh. And that he went to Damascus in order to persecute Christians. And so when the disciple, when he came to the disciples, he just said, they just said no. They didn't believe that he was a disciple. They said, this is a trick. <laughs> you know? You see, sometimes you just have to go about the master's business. Because you will get resistance, especially from those who were in the church before you. I, uh... Do you get what I'm saying? <laughs> People that have been in the church all their lives, they feel entitled. They feel that they should be getting more blessings than you. They feel that they should be getting sometimes, not all the time, sometimes they feel like they should be, have a, a, a more powerful anointing than you because of the time that they spent in the church. But sitting in the pews and being in church does not mean you are saved. And sitting in the pews does not mean that you have a relationship with God. And so, the disciples, some, you see, sometimes you just have to just do God's work and preach his word. And preach his word. They, are, they were afraid of the anointing, or sometimes people are afraid of the anointing that God has on your life. They feel like that anointing should be theirs. But God is the one who gives that anointing. Not any man. And so that anointing is for you. 
And once God gives it to you, you should go and just do his work. And don't wait to be accepted. Some people will want to know how it is that you just got baptized. And you are so powerful in the Lord. You just got baptized. And so sometimes they will not listen to you when you tell them God said this or God spoke to you or you had a vision or you had a dream. They would think that if there was a dream to be had, they should have it because they were in church longer than you. But that's not how God operates. And so sometimes you can't wait on acceptance, as I said, or approval because you might never get that approval or acceptance. You just have to go and do God's work. There will always be those who will feel threatened by you and by your ministry. Mm -hmm. Regardless of how nice you try to be, people will always be threatened by your ministry, by the anointing that God has on your life. And so, just go and do it. Verse 27 says, But, but Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he declared to him how he had seen the Lord on the road and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. So Barnabas now is testifying to the disciples that Paul, that Saul is a man of God and he is a disciple even though he was just baptized because this is what he saw, right? And he know, he, he found out that he was, that he met the Lord on the road to Damascus. And then he heard him preach and how he was preaching powerfully in Damascus in the name of Jesus. And then the disciples, they believed because Barnabas said it and they accepted Saul. And so he spent some time with them. But this is where Paul's ministry begins. And now I will tell you, I will call him Paul because some believe that his name was changed on the road to Damascus. But the Bible, as the account goes in Acts, still refers to him as Saul up until Acts chapter 13. Every time they speak to him, it's called, he's called Saul. But right here is where his ministry begins and this is where he is called Paul. Now, Acts 13 verse 2. As they ministered, to the Lord and fasted the Holy Spirit said no separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them you see sometimes God wants us to be separated I... do you get me mm -hmm. sometimes we have to be separated to do God's work because if all of us stay together, the, the ministry will take longer to spread. But sometimes we have to be separated. God, call, God calls some of us out for a special work. To go and do a special work. And so he said to them, the Holy Spirit said to them, No, separate to me. Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So they had to go to a separate calling because you see the disciples were preaching to the Jews. But Paul was called or Saul was called to preach to the Gentiles, to the Aye. Greeks. The disciples could not really reach the Jews because the experiences that they had was different from the Jewish and the customs were different. And so some of us, our testimonies can only reach some people. Do you get what I'm saying? Some people need to hear our testimonies. My wife's testimony can only can, can reach people that I cannot reach. My testimony can reach people that my pastor might not be able to reach. His testimony would reach people that I might not be able to reach. And so the disciples 
were not able to reach the Gentiles as they should. And so Jesus called Saul to be Paul for the Jewish people, for, the, for the, the Gentiles and the Greeks. Because his name, Saul, was Hebrew. But because he was also a Roman citizen, at that time it was okay to really be called by two names. And he had also a Greek name, which was Paul. And the Gentiles could relate more to a Paul than to a Saul. Because if a Paul came to talk to them, it's, it's a Greek person. But if a Saul comes to speak to them, here it is that a, a Hebrew is coming. You hear what I'm saying? And so God had to use Paul to reach the Greeks. Now, the scripture goes on to say in verse 3, that having fasted and prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them away. And so they laid hands on them and sent them out to do the work of God. Paul was called, as I was saying, to preach to the Greeks and to the Gentiles. And as he launched his ministry to the Gentiles, he started using the Greek name. It was not uncommon at that time for him to do that. And so, until up to Acts chapter 13 verse 9, he was still referred to as Saul. But, here it is from this verse, you're going to see where the scripture refers to him as Paul. And I'll read it for you. Paul and Saul and Barnabas had gone through the island to Papos. And a, and a proconsul sought them to hear the word of God. And so Saul and Barnabas went to this place, Papos, and a proconsul, which is an important man, sought them out to hear the word of God. But there was a sorcerer, and his name was Elymas. Who came before Saul and Barnabas? This is how Saul dealt with him. From verse 9. And Saul said, Who also is called Paul? So right here in Acts 13 verse 9 is where you see the scripture start calling Saul Paul. It says in verse 9, Then Saul, who also is called Paul, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he looked in, intently at him. This is at the sorcerer. And said, O oh, full of all deceit, all fraud. Straight away the Holy Spirit told Paul that this man was a sorcerer and that he was deceitful. And so he said to him, O oh, you that full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil. He wasn't messing around. Straight to the point. You son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness. Will you not cease preventing or perverting the straight ways of the Lord? So right away, Paul rebuked him because he went to stop Paul and Barnabas from preaching the word that this man wanted to hear. And right away, Paul rebuked him. And he said, I know indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you and you shall be blind. So Paul did not deal easily with him. He said, I know you will be blind not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately the scripture says, immediately a dark mist fell upon him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. So right away the sorcerer went blind. In verse 12 it says, Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done, being astonished, at the teaching of the Lord. And so, when Paul dealt with the sorcerer, the proconsul believed, and then Paul preached to him, he believed the word of God. And this was the beginning of Paul's ministry. And he went on to become a great evangelist. The scripture says, if we move to verse, six, verse 14 of Acts 13, it says, Then Paul went to Antioch, 
in Pasadena and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Acts chapter 13 verse 4. And in verse 16 it says, Then Paul stood up and motioning with his hand said, Men of Israel, and ye who hear, who fear God, listen. And so Paul began to preach. And Acts 13 42 it says in New King James Version, So when the Jews went out of the synagogue, the Gentiles begged that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. And so Paul continued from Sabbath to Sabbath, preaching the gospel. Verse 40, 44 of Acts 13 says, On the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the word of Yahweh. And so, as Paul preached so full of the Holy Spirit, the Gentiles came and said, can we hear this same word that you preach to the Jews? And Paul said, yes, the next Sabbath we'll do it. And the next Sabbath, almost the entire city came to hear the word of God. As the scripture goes on, it says, we read from verse 12, And from there to Philippi, which the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony, and we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was custom customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the woman, to the women who met there. If we move on to Acts 17 from verse 1. Now when they had passed through Amphilippus and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Then Paul, as his custom was, verse 2, went into them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures. Verse 3, explaining and demonstrating that the Messiah had to suffer and raise again from the dead and saying, This Yahweh, whom I preach to you, is the Messiah. And some of them were persuaded and a great multitude of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women joined Paul and Silas. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And he continued there a year and six months preaching the word of God among them. So Paul preached in Corinth for 72 consecutive, consecutive Sabbaths, 18 months sabbath after sabbath this is in acts scholars say that paul wrote the biggest chunk of the bible in the shortest period of time he wrote more than half of the new testament over a period of 17 years and about half of that was written over a period of three years from 80 from 61 to 63 AD. During this time, he wrote Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippines, and Hebrews, 1 Timothy, and Titus. He wrote four of these letters in prison, which might explain why he was so prolific. We know that 2 Timothy was written when Paul was in, in, in a Roman prison from AD 66 to 67, and that during this time, Paul was, ante was uh, anticipating his death. He said, I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. This is at the end of his ministry. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8. You see, Paul did the work that God called him to do. He preached the gospel without compromise yes. to anyone if he went into a city and there was sorcery he rebuked it he preached them he told them the truth he even converted an entire city that were that were under sorcery and followed idolatry and he rebuked them and told them to get rid of all the idols and to serve a living god because they were listening to, to idols that cannot hear or see them and the people listened. Paul was such a powerful preacher that he is responsible for 
preaching the gospel and spreading it to more places than any other disciple, as according to scripture. Jesus is the only one that is more popular than Paul in the scripture. And Paul never got tired of preaching the gospel. He preached so much and so profoundly. He had so much to say in teaching that at one point he was preaching all night to the point that there was a young man in the balcony because the place was so packed that people had to be in the balcony. And that young man fell asleep and fell from the bank balcony and died. And Paul came, left his preaching, left the pulpit and came to him and revived him, prayed over him and he resurrected, came back to life, went back and sat down and listened to the gospel and Paul went back to the pulpit and preached. That's who Paul was. Paul was, I would say, filled with the Holy Spirit so much that people could not help but listen to him. And that was because of the anointing that Jesus put on his life. Because when he came, when he was converted or when he met Jesus, when he saw that light, the light that came among, me, among men that John speaks about in John chapter 1, that light, when he saw that light and he understood that that light was Jesus, he never looked back. He knew at that point that the Messiah was here. That Jesus was the Messiah. And the same zeal that he used to persecute the Christians, he used to preach the gospel and preach Jesus crucified. But because he, per he persecuted the Christians, he also had something else to prove. He had something else to make up for. The, the persecution of Jesus' people he could never make up for that. That's how he felt. And so he just kept on wanting to do more and more and more and more. And he was never satisfied as to really doing enough for Jesus. So really what I want to say to you is, have you seen this light? Do you know who Jesus is? Have you had an encounter with Jesus? Did you have a Damascus moment where Jesus revealed himself to you? If Jesus revealed himself to you and you have that you had that moment, then I would say to you do not allow anything to stop you from doing God's work. Do not wait on anyone to ordain you. Do not wait on anyone to commission you. As long as you know that you are ordained by Jesus, and you are called by Jesus, and you are commissioned by Jesus, then you go and you do Jesus' work. In the Great Commission, he tells us to go and preach the gospel. Teach it to all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have taught you. And this is what Paul was doing, and this is what we need to do. So, if you have met him, I would say, praise God. But if you do not know who Jesus is, challenge him. Challenge him to reveal himself to you. Challenge him as my friend that's watching RV challenged him. And he has a powerful testimony of how he challenged God to reveal himself, Jesus to reveal himself to him. And Jesus revealed himself to him. The same way that my cousin in England, Ryan, challenged him to reveal himself and make him known to him. And he touched him and healed him. And now he's off his medication. The majority of his medication. He's in no more pain. That's what you call a Damascus moment. That's, how, that's when you meet Jesus. When you have seen the light. And you accept him and you open up and allow that light to come inside of you and change you as a person. And so, if you do not know Jesus and you are still doubtful as to if Jesus is real, 
I would say challenge him, as I said before. Ask him. He reads your heart. So he knows if you're really seeking him or not. The reason that he changed my life is because I surrendered completely to him. And the person that prayed for me was totally devoted to God. And she had the faith that God would do what she asked him to do. Yeah. And so if we pray with faith, the same way God will do what we want him to do or what we ask him to do. The scripture says that anything that we ask him for without, without doubt in our heart, that he will do it. The main word here is without doubt in our heart. So believe. Trust God. Do not doubt him. The scripture says if you believe, you can ask a mountain to move from here and go over there and it will move. So these mountains in your life, like death and this coronavirus that are killing so many people, I'm in the heart of it. We live in New York and people are dying by the hundreds every day. The last time, I don't even listen to the news anymore sometimes because I used to listen to it every day and it just depresses you. It makes you feel like the, all it is is death. But you have to be positive and know that there are people who are being saved, right? Like there are people, almost a thousand people that were dying per day. Then there was 700 and something. The last time I listened, I think it was yesterday, the day before, the governor was saying that it's down to 670 something or something like that, that were dying every day. That's a lot of people to be dying in one state every day. And that's nothing to do with the people that are dying worldwide. But there are people that are being healed also, that God is healing. But for God to heal you, you have to believe in him. You have to trust in him. You have to not doubt. You have to accept him. The president of our conference, Don Daniel Honoré, his son, he was healed miraculously. His son was healed. My pastor, Pastor John, his son was healed. We have a friend that we were praying for, Anne Marie. Marie. She and and she only not only that. was healed, she was she went into the hospital just suffering to the point that she could not walk. And she was wasting away. Her heart stopped. They had to resuscitate her, give her the heart compressions like 10 times. She could not walk. And the same day that <clears throat> my the same sister, Sunni. I'm own sister, my wife's sister, that prayed for me when God changed my life. She called her because she knows her and she called her and she answered the phone in the hospital. And Sunni prayed for her. And she was able to answer the phone and she prayed for her. And we were all praying for her. Fasting and praying. Fasting and praying for her. Sunni fasted, I think, for like one week. We fasted for about three days. But we were fasting and praying for her. And that same day that Sunny called her and prayed for her, she was released from hospital. Not only released from hospital, but she got up and walked out of the hospital. And when she was being dis discharged, the nurse said to her, do you know that you are the only person in this entire ward that was discharged, that was healed? Everyone else in the host in that hospital ward died. And that woman, Anne Marie, was the only person that got up and walked out of that ward. You see what faith can do? God knows who he will heal. There's some people that he will take or allow to go because it's there. It's that at that time they might make themselves right with God. And he knows that that's the time that he has to take them to save their souls, like what he did with my father and with Amos' father. But some people will be lost because they never knew him. And they never trusted him. But at the same time, in this crisis time, right here in New York and all over this world, people will be healed. And they will come out of this pandemic with a testimony that they'll be able to tell the world what Jesus did for them. And how he healed them. And so as I leave you here tonight. 
I want you to just understand and remember if you don't take anything else away from this message tonight when God lays a message on my heart I have to put it to the people and I have to tell them and so this message was laid on my heart to tell you today and I believe that God wanted you to hear this and he will allow those who he wants to hear it to hear it and he will soften the hearts of those who hear it who he wants to go to his father and he will they will accept this message and so do not give up on Jesus trust him and if you don't know him seek him he is the son of God he is the only one by no other name anyone cannot get to heaven he is the way the truth and the life and he's the only way to heaven Jesus Christ through him and therefore before we go keep trusting God but I also want you to pray continue to pray pray without ceasing the enemy wants us to be depressed he wants us to to, to look at how many people are dying and believe that if God was was real why would so much people be dying but he don't want you to see the fact that so many people are being healed. You see, God sometimes allows things to happen to us because we turn our back on Him. And this nation has turned its back on God. We took God, we took the Ten Commandments out of the schools and out of the state and out of the cities. And we turned our back on God. A few years ago, People in this country could not even, they did not even want to talk about God or talk about Jesus because they felt like they would be looked at as crazy if they mentioned the name Jesus Christ. But today, during this pandemic, nurses, entire staffs at Walmart and at different stores are kneeling and praying to God in public. And they are doing it in the hospitals. Entire staffs are kneeling and praying to God in hospitals. People are praying in public. People are going online and they're talking about the news, on the news, on CNN, on different where they they're talking about God. And they're not scared to talk about God anymore. So do you see, things sometimes have to happen to us for God to, to show himself, for, for, for you to understand that God is in control. And you cannot deny God. Because he is the one that has the power to heal this nation. He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, I will hear from heaven and I will heal their land. And so if we want God to heal this land and heal his people and heal our people, we need to come together and we need to pray. We need to pray and ask God earnestly in prayer and fasting Go down on your knees and repent and fast and ask God. Ask God for forgiveness. Ask God. I heard a senator. This was unheard of a few years ago. I heard a senator posted something where he repented to the point of tears. Asking God for forgiveness for what this nation have done. And that's what we need to do. We need to, instead of our pastors and our people preaching feel good messages and prosperity messages, we need to be telling the people what they're doing wrong and how they're turning their backs on God and teach them what is right so that they can come to God and repent of their sins and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior so that this nation can be healed. This nation needs to go back to what they have on the money. In God we trust. They need to start trusting in God again. They need to put the Ten Commandments back in the schools. And put God back in the schools. In the state, in the city, in the government. Because if this is done, put the Bibles back in school, less children will end up in prison. You take the Bible out to the school, but then when they get to prison, they could read the Bible. But they can't read the Bible in schools. That doesn't make any sense. 
We need to go back to our, our to scripture. We need to go back to, to, to God and repent. And God has laid this message on my heart tonight. And I hope that whoever is watching, that you will believe that God is real. It's not my job to convince you. I know why I believe God is real. Because he has touched me. He has healed me. The fact that I could hold my hand straight up like this is a testimony of who God is. As a healer, the, the fact that I'm here alive right now is a testimony that God is a healer and he's real. And so, it's up to you. The scripture says that no one can come to the Son unless the Father brings him. But also, the scripture says that no one can go to the Father unless they go through the Son. That's the scripture. And so, know who Jesus is. Find out who he is. Repent and accept Christ. Let's pray. I'm going to pray for all those who need prayer and all those who ask me to pray for them. Send me messages. And if you have any prayer requests, feel free to send me a message on WhatsApp. Send me a message on here. And we are, our, our church is going through 100 days of prayer right now. And um, church, all the churches in the conferences from the general conference right now. And so our church is doing it at 6 p.m. every day. And at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, we call in on a conference line and pray together as a church. But on our own, we do it at 6 p.m. every day. And if you want to join us, at 6 p.m. every day, we can pray together for God to heal this nation and for God to heal all those who are sick. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I come before you. I thank you, Lord, for your word. Thank you for your message. Forgive me for the stuttering and the stumbling over your word, dear Father, because I'm just a lump of clay. But I pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, will take this message and make it good and make it straight and make it to be what you wanted it to be so that it would reach the ears of those who want to hear this message. I pray that you will heal your people, that as they reach out to you and pray, dear Father, that you will lean down from heaven your ear and that you will heal them, that you will hear them and heal their nation. Heal this nation, our nation. Heal, Lord, all the nations of the world. I pray for Guyana, that what is going on in Guyana would, would be solved. The elections and, and the COVID-19, everything that's happening all over the world, I pray that God, Lord, will heal the land and heal the people and heal those in Barbados and all over the world. In England, dear Father, in Canada, I can't call all the countries of the world, but all those who are listening, I pray that God will touch you and heal you. I pray for Speed's father, that you, will, Lord, will touch him in a special way and heal him. I pray for Rosalie that's still in a coma and is still on ventilator. But God, you have the last word. And if it be your will, I pray that you will bring her off the ventilator and bring her out and help her to walk out to the hospital with a testimony. Because when the doctors say no, you can say yes. And just as... Our friend Anne Marie walked out to the hospital and she was the only person that ward. You can do it with Rosalie, dear father. And so we ask you to heal her. Thank you for healing Ryan. Continue to work with him and on him. I pray for Sharon, dear father, that you, Lord, will touch her in a special way, that she would come closer to you and be able to, 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 to see you and know you as her Lord and Savior. Become even closer every day. And I pray that Ryan would also come close every day. Touch them, dear Father. I thank you for healing my aunt, Monica. Because one of my uncles, Joshua, said that he has his sister back. I pray that you will touch Jason, dear Father. Heal him. Heal Devon. Heal all of our loved ones. I pray for Karen and, and Ian and Donston and Joseph and Gracie. Uncle Eddie, Uncle, even Uncle Wilfred, dear father, and Uncle Frank and Joshua and Uncle Philip, Uncle John, all of my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, they're too numerous for me to call the names, but they know who they are. I pray, Lord, that you will continue to bless us all, protect us and keep us, 
pushed by every force of darkness from around all of us, from around myself, my wife, my my son, dear father, from around Amo, Alana, Ajani, Tatiana, Armani, my mother, Amo's mother, her sisters, and their families, my brothers, all those who are watching and their families, dear father, push by every force of darkness from around them, nullify the work of the enemy against them. And Lord, I appropriate the merits of the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on Calvary's cross to each life. Keep them safe, dear father. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. And I pray, Lord, that may God bless you and keep you until next week, Friday, when God will put another message on my heart to give you. Take care and God bless you. Bye.